Tell your friends! Tell your friends about Hooks and Ladders, but also about songstudio.ca. You can get all kinds of information about songwriting, tips and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, like, follow and subscribe. That's what we need, that's what you need. Hey, welcome to Hooks and Ladders. What you're about to see is part of what we did at the Song Studio Workshop in Toronto in July 2022. There'll be lots more to see. We're just going to roll it out a little bit at a time. So sit back and enjoy. And if you want to know more about Song Studio, visit www.songstudio.ca and check us out. Enjoy. Please welcome, if you would, Ron Hawkins. Hello. Ron uh, is, a, is a musician songwriter. Of course, he's a songwriter. That's why he's here to help us with that. But um, he's a band leader, um, uh, an activist. He's, he's a thinking man songwriter. And uh, uh, I really enjoy his music a lot. He's had a lot of success uh, doing it himself, uh, doing it for himself. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about all that stuff uh, as well as his uh, approach to songwriting and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. I'm for glad I'm here. Us. Yeah. So the band that you're most f uh, famously known for is Popular Front. No, I'm joking. That was a band that he had before he had his his popular band. So, but let's let's go back to when, when did you start writing songs? How old were you? Uh, I think I started. My dad plays classical piano. My, I come from a family where my a very working class family. My dad was a window cleaner who played classical piano. Mm. So that kind of sums up almost most of what my career has become because I'm really into music and the the sort of politics or the social activism uh, I grew up with also with a bunch of uncles who were actual bank robbers so I had a lot of weird <laughs> spice in my my That's upbringing amazing. yeah so um, I think I picked up a guitar I was a go I was a hockey goaltender and I was very good at it and I was that was my stream I wanted to be an NHL goalie until uh, what a lot of parents who have hockey playing kids don't realize I became 16 puberty I started you know um, flirting with girls and finding out about punk rock and stuff like that. And suddenly I just didn't want to do it anymore. And I, and I picked up a guitar and started writing songs. So probably doing that kind of emulating the Beatles, right. writing, you know, sort of writing really obvious ripoffs of other songs. Right. Right. Yeah. But not as good as those songs were. <laughs> right. Inevitably. Yeah. When you first started writing songs, did you have, uh, was the experience of that, of, of just sort of this, um, the miracle of birth basically like, We've we've talked about how there's this magical uh, when you when you write songs it just sort of comes out of you at first and rewriting doesn't even cross your mind was mm -hmm. it like that with your first songs? Uh, no, because the songs were already written. As I said, I ripped them off. Other oh, people. I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right. there were just very right. subtle twists on other people's songs. And I <laughs> okay. think it was a bit of a, I know a, it was almost like this thing flowered in my neighborhood with all the kids uh, suddenly got guitars from their uncles and aunts or whatever, whoever, and we wound up in basements messing about trying to learn songs and you know not really thinking we put a band together but sort of just trying to entertain each other just and playing with it, yeah yeah I and mean, where was this geographically uh right around here at greenwood and gerard i grew up right right so yeah and, and all those kids were it was a gas because <clears throat> we had you know i was a big beetle fan and and uh sort of burgeoning into the punk rock thing and then i we had like kim mitchell fans and rush fans and so it was like everybody brought a completely different style <laughs> And, you know, and most of those things, not particularly acoustic friendly, you know, but we would try to hammer out stuff and right. see what, you know, I guess it was the very beginnings of like, do I have a voice on this thing or, you know, right. I, you know, you don't think in those terms when you're that age, you're just sort of like messing around. But now I know it was like, we were all kind of looking for like, what is, what, what do I think about music? What do I think about this thing? You know? Right. Right. And, and your first songs, like when you started writing songs that were more you, more like more original, like mm -hmm. stepping away from that other stuff, um, what were you writing about? Relationships? Uh, well, or the very, very early ones. Yeah, the very early ones were imagined relationships. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, and then very, like when I was 15, I got very political. I got into it through the sort of anti-nukes uh, peace um, movement in my, out of my school, out of my high school, Riverdale Collegiate. And then quickly found myself moving quite left and became a Marxist. And so then I was hanging out in school with another Marxist kid who was into punk rock. And then we started a band, which was this sort of what you would call a straight edge Marxist punk rock band. So straight edge meaning 
we didn't do drugs or drink or anything like we were like serious, you know, like very serious. We're going to change the world. We're going to change it through music, you know, and, and uh, as silly as that sounds in in hindsight, you know, we were that adamant about it. Yeah. And we had all of that sort of bravado and um, chest beating that comes when you haven't really tried it yet. And <laughs> the world hasn't kicked you around at all. And, you know. Yeah, but the idealism of youth. The idealism was there. Like, yeah. we're going to, Beatles who? Like, we're going to, nobody's going to remember those guys when we're finished, you know, <laughs> doing what we're going to do. And uh, so we started writing songs. And I had a great uh, relationship with my friend Ken, who was the other guy and the other writer in the band, not unlike uh, uh, Lennon and McCartney, that sort of, like, I knew he's going to write 15 songs this month, so I have to write 16 songs. Right. You know, it was, we just had this thing, and it was like, and we I liked his stuff, and he liked my stuff, and we would tweak each other's stuff and comment but that's a beautiful if you find something like that it's a beautiful thing because it's a healthy uh way to spur yourself out of any kind of procrastination or anything because a little competition yeah and yeah. And, and, a, and a and a but a person who also encourages you yeah we were talking about that and it, it, easier to find when you're a teenager i think um but we were talking about the the uh idea of having co-writers and and so, some of the people have done a lot of co-writing and some of the people haven't done any and there's mm. some people in between but uh, yeah finding a co-writer i think is more difficult when you're you know middle-aged or thereabouts you know or um or, or even in your 20s or 30s uh, as a teenager, I think you can you can sort of get a gang together kind of thing. Yeah, and when you're a teenager, like the drummer in our in that band, as I say, it was like a Marxist punk rock band, and we had this drummer who was a total misogynist, homophobe dude. It was like he was in our high school. It's like he was the guy who had the drum kit. So it was like, I guess you're the drummer. Yeah, even and though nothing totally about you sense. aligns with what we believe. Yeah, yeah. But you have a drum kit, and <laughs> your dad has a van, so you're in the band. <laughs> and then you know of course yeah. that lasted as long as you imagine it would last like about six months and we we're like oh my god i can't hand, i can't be in a band with this guy anymore you know <laughs> and but so when you're as you say when you're middle age it's like you're you've got all those things worked out and yeah you, you know you yeah. don't need to be you don't need to grab the person with the drum kit <laughs> the person who's most readily available yeah yeah um uh punk rock you mentioned was was that a turning point for you in terms of what you could write about like yeah, I think what it is, is that I, I, as I, as you and I have talked about before, like I had, I was living this kind of bipolar life, which it was like, I was very politically active and I was also a burgeoning musician and they seemed like separate lanes. Right. And then I just got, you know, I saw the Sex Pistols and I saw the Clash and I saw all these bands, Minor Threat and all these people who suddenly I was like, oh, you know, I see how I can dovetail these interests together. And, uh. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe the things I want to say, I can say them through this other, this medium. Yeah. And, you know, and at the same time, I was also like, it wasn't just punk rock, even though I think punk rock is a folk medium anyway. Yeah. Uh, I was also a big folk fan. So like, I liked people that were wordy. I liked people like Bob Dylan and, you know, Billy Bragg and uh, Woody Guthrie and all these people that would tell stories and, uh, and write, so, you know, social uh, activist songs. Social commentary, social activist. Sure. And then later you yeah. find hip hop and it's like, to me, it's like, these are all folk, folk genres, yeah. punk, hip hop, folk music. They're all the same, right? They're people's music trying to tell, uh, trying to discuss ways in which we're uh, not happy. Yeah. Yeah. And the way we don't fit into the overarching narrative, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the narrative that, that uh, the corporate world wants you to uh, believe that you're part of and, and, and you are part of it, whether you like it or not to a point, but you know what I mean? The, the, it's nice to know that there's an alternative viewpoint out there. Uh, and, and people, you know, flock to that when they find it. And, and in this case, you know, uh, if punk rock was a catalyst for you, that's, that's fantastic. Did you, when you started playing out, did you uh, know other bands? Like you're, you're younger than uh, Andrew Cash and, and uh, Charlie Angus and, and Latrange and so forth. Mm -hmm. But were they, did you know about those guys? Yeah, those yeah. guys were a huge. And uh, we had some funny moments, which was like when my, so my first band was called Social Insecurity. And uh, we were huge L'Etrange fans, which is Charlie Angus and Andrew Cash, who have now gone on to be MPs. <laughs> and, uh, but awesome guys and very committed from the, from the ground up, from the get-go. Like Charlie, uh, Charlie bought a house with a bunch of people and turned it into a place where it was full of art and full of musicians and everything, but also people who were just recently out of prison and mm -hmm. homeless people, they could come and eat and stay there. And he said, you know, to, and that worked the way you might Imagine it worked. It was an amazing uh, experience and a, a compassionate outlet. It was also a shit show, right? Because you know it's a very volatile, unpredictable group of people in there. Yeah. So that's how committed they were, and uh, their band. You know, we were always like, oh man, if we could, if we could ever open for L'Etranger, 
we'd be set. And like, I think within six months of our band starting, we opened for L'Etranger and we were like, oh, now we have to have a bigger, now we have to have another dream. Like what's our <laughs> next dream, right? That was as big as we could think at that point. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I didn't know that about Charlie buying a house. That's, that's kind of amazing. So when you played places, you played the, the usual Larry's Hideaway. Turning Point. Turning Point, Cabana Room. Yeah. Places like that. Um, it's funny having that as your goal and then, and then, and then, yeah, yeah. And then living up to it. Um, what was the next goal? Where did you, where did you go from there? What was, well, I remember we had a very, um, fractious idea about how we would become famous. We knew that we wanted to get our music out. We knew that to get our music out to the most amount of people meant we had to become famous somehow. Right. And have a, have a, as they say today, have a platform. So, um, we just, you know, we did what everybody would do is we went to all the record companies in Canada and tried to get signed. And every, every subsequent band, including Lois to the Low, who wound up taking off, we all went to all the uh, record labels in Canada and got roundly, you know, spun around and pushed back out the door like nobody wanted to, to know about it yeah. in any way. Yeah. Didn't get what we were doing, didn't really want to deal with us. And it, was a, it was a funny time. This was in the early 80s. Yeah, so social yeah. insecurity would be like 83 to end of 84. Right, okay. And then it exploded. So, so at that time, uh, corporate record company, like big corporations, they were, there were many of them, by the way. Now there's like two, there's three. Uh, but because one of them, Universal, bought all the others. Um, but um, there were many record companies, and uh, uh, some of them would respond if you had a following. Um, so let's say you, you, the band had a following, they, they, that would be good for them. But like, it's not like it is now where you have to have... Uh, you know, many likes and many followers, millions of them before they'll consider signing you. Um, in those days, some of the labels, the label that my band worked with, didn't want you to have a following because then they couldn't mold you in the way that they wanted right. to, which to me is so absurd. So, but it was, a, it was a different mindset. So at that point, but that's really the only option that we kind of had in a way was to make demos, not make recordings to release, at least my band, we, we never were bright enough to do that. You know, we actually had a video that was being played on Much Music, and we, we never released anything to go with it. And it was getting played regularly all the time, right. like in the early days of Much Music. So, you know, not so smart. Um, did you, but that band didn't release anything. Uh, we, we were part of a, this will sound ludicrous at this point in history, but we were part of a pirate radio station that was run out of, this little punk rock pirate radio station run out of a warehouse at um, Parliament and River, Oh, and built, um, yeah. yeah, and we and and there were zines like every month there was a thing called F Noise, which was a collected zine, and it had a cassette with it, and it had a certain amount of you know just very locally based, but it had a certain amount of followers, and and uh, and that's one of the ways we you would do it back then if you couldn't get on the radio was just to sort of like have the grassroots thing and pass cassettes around and right, 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 right. Parliament and King, right? yeah, like a. Uh, Oh, sorry, Parliament and King. Yeah, right yeah. across from where the Derby Tavern was. Like yeah, right at, yeah, across from the Derby. That's and as right. I, yeah, yeah. As I uh, yeah. found out later, uh, I was talking to, to, much later, Lois Lowe got signed by Warner, and I was talking to Steve Kane, their president, and I was telling him about this pirate radio station, and he said, he said oh, man, we probably passed each other in the halls in that place, because it was uh, one of those places that was kind of not zoned for living, but it was like artists, and the artists would kind of live there, too. They're you not know? supposed to, but yeah, not yeah. really supposed to. And then the yeah. cops cleared it all out in the, I think early nineties or something, but right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew people who lived there as well. Um, uh, okay. So we've talked about lowest of the low, but before that there was popular front. So did that band, the, the previous band morph into popular front? Pretty How much did, like the, yeah. like the, my other, my co-writer, Ken friend, uh, we, as I say, we were in a very serious left organization and I got sort of what would you call it? Like a, an ultimatum laid at my feet by the party leaders of this group uh, saying, you know, like even, even Dylan had to choose between the SWP and, and music and he, cause Dylan was in the socialist workers party uh, really, really early on. Uh, you, you know, can't do both. You got to commit, either commit to real social change in the world, or you can be a petty bourgeois musician, I guess, if you want. Right. So I went, see ya. And I, and I left, but my other friend uh, decided that he was going to commit himself to that, to that lane, which was very interesting because I, I've, I still know him today and we get together and I find that he's gone through the world and done uh, lots of things. He was in Argentina when, when all that stuff was going down there and he's been in China and everything. And I just find that we've walked seemingly very different pa paths, but have done very similar things with our lives. Really? Uh, 
just in different mediums, really. You know? Right. So different paths, but parallel. Yeah. 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 And, and one of those things, and it, and it speaks to what uh, a good songwriting team we were, is that uh, we would be doing similar things without even talking to each other. Like he oh, would wow. be a continent away from me and I would catch up with him six months later and find out what he was doing. And we'd be like, oh, wow. Well, guess what I was doing? You know, and almost like we were separated at birth twins. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. You That's find crazy. Doing the wow. same things. Yeah. So, and then, um, so then we started popular front Yes, with the same drummer, uh, in social insecurity, David, I've been playing with him for 40 years. Wow. Next year, it'll be 40 years. So he was in social insecurity. He was the drummer. Ken left. And then we met, uh, our friend, Steven Stanley, who later would be, uh, the three of us would be in a band called Lois of the Low, but we were in a band called popular front and we sort of, you know, dog paddled through the rest of the eighties, uh, trying to write kind of capital P political songs with, you know, and, you know, as was the, the, the day, like we were kind of U2 fans and, you know, just sort of like singing, singing about things that we didn't have first person experience with. We sort of had abstract, you know, knowledge of, and we were intelligent guys and we could imagine it, but we, I would write songs about that kind of stuff. And it was, it was, uh, I don't want to say wildly unpopular, but it was, uh, it was not successful, you know, like it was, and I think the part the problem being was it probably wasn't coming from a hundred percent authentic place. It was more like I had read the encyclopedia Britannica and then wrote a bunch of songs, you know, like, and, uh, so toward the end of that band, when we finally realized we were just spinning our wheels and I had a very, uh, interesting for anybody who's ever had that, like, what am I doing? Am I crazy? This is crazy what I'm doing. Uh, David, the drummer and I pulled up from a gig in about 1989 after a horrible gig at Strattinger's, which still exists here. And I think only my girlfriend was at the show and he just turned to me and he said, we, you know, we should just pack it in. And I was like, I know, yeah, I know what you mean. And we were so down. And I said, look, this is not a decision we should make tonight, like a sleep on it, you know, whatever. So, so we slept on it and had enough, I guess, left in the tank that we decided not to just quit, but we changed directions a little bit and, um, dismantled the big band. We popular front was about a seven piece band, dismantled that band. And Steven, David and I just started doing like free times cafe, like open night folk night, uh, as a stripped down two acoustics and Dave would play a stand up snare. And I started writing in a slightly different way. I started pulling it all kind of closer to home and writing about my friends and writing about the bars I would hang out in. And the politics were still there. They were just kind of like hidden, you know, baked into the cake as opposed to like, I'm hitting you over the head with this idea. And, uh, and suddenly that band started to take off. So it might've only been maybe six months between that horrible discussion in the car. Uh, and then we started to see people coming back to our, you know, acoustic shows and then more people and then more people and then we decided well we better make it electric again and we got a bass player and then my band Los Lotes sort of took off out of that and it was a real great lesson for anybody who wanted to look at it or for myself that A uh, you don't have to abandon the big things that are important to you but you have to make them more uh, I think Blair might have said to it said this to me which is that ironically uh almost like the less universal, the more local you make it, the more universal it becomes in a weird way. And I don't know how that math works, but it, I can tell you personally that it does work. We hope you've enjoyed this little taste of the Song Studio Workshop in Toronto in July, 2022. Stay tuned for more.